Uh, so welcome everybody. It's a real pleasure to have uh, Deborah Waller uh, with us today. She's a professor of bio biological sciences at Old Dominion University. She's a great friend of ours, uh, so we're really happy to have her. Uh, she's going to be talking about a fascinating topic. Uh, so she received her, her bachelor's of science in biology from George Washington University and her PhD in zoology from the University of Texas. Uh, since she's been at Old Dominion, she teaches, she's been teaching classes on forensic and medical entomology uh, and has mentored uh, many graduate students and undergraduate students. Um, she's also a strong advocate of diversity. She's the chair of the diversity uh, committee, which I'm part of. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to have Debbie join us and give a talk for us. And so I'm gonna be sharing her slides, which everybody should be able to see and so, Debbie, whenever you want me to go ahead and change the slide, just let me know, okay? Okay, I sure will. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to talk to you about forensic entomology today, in which we can use insects to help solve some crimes. So, Raoul, could you change the slide? So, I'm, I'm giving you a hypothetical scenario of a crime, and this is based on many crimes that have been tried in, in the legal system, and this is just kind of a, a compilation of all these different aspects of those crimes. So it's fictional, but it's, it's very true to life. And in this case, um, the insect helped identify the murderer. So um, Raoul, can you do it? Slide, thank you. So first I wanna in introduce the crime scene. Um, the body of a 55-year-old woman, Pamela Martin, was found in a state of advanced decay um, on a path to a cabin that she owned with her husband. Um, her husband found the body on March 30th. And the husband, John, and his wife had driven up to the cabin on March 1st. So the last time that she was seen was on March 1st. John was a truck driver, and he went off on a job in the northeastern part of the state after leaving Mar um, Pamela there at the cabin. Um, next slide. So Pamela Martin, she was a retired former school librarian. She was a very quiet person. She had a heart condition and arthritis. So she took medication for those ailments. Um, she'd been married to John for 30 years. And as I said, he was a truck driver. He was often gone months at a time and they had no children. Slide. So the cabin was very isolated. It was a mountain cabin. Um, and there were not close neighbors. They were several kilometers away. There was no internet access and it was out of range of cell phone service. So there really was no communication. And they went up there frequently. They did repairs on the cabin and John would often leave Pamela there when he was out traveling on his job. Slide. So the police were called by John when he discovered the body. He discovered it on March 30th. He had dropped Mar um, Pamela off on the 1st of March, and then he returned on the 30th and found her dead. And so he called them on his citizen band radio, and they came to investigate the scene. And I, as a forensic entomologist, took my team to go collect the entomological evidence, which is often crucial in determining time of death. And the police went out and interviewed John and the neighbors to find out what had happened. Slide. So the husband, John, he was kind of a deadbeat. All his life he had had low paying jobs, um, primarily in sales. Now he had a better paying truck driving job, but he was worried that he was gonna be fired. And when the police investigated, they found that he had taken out a $500,000 life insurance policy on Pamela only three months earlier. So he became the prime suspect in the case. Slide. So the other um, locals included the owner of the general store. Um, the general store is about 10 kilometers away from the Martin's cabin. And it was owned and operated by Julia Snow. And she had lived in the town all her life. She knew everybody. She was a big gossip. So she was kind of the new center of the area. 
And she said that um, Pam and, and John had stopped at her store on March 1st on the way up to the cabin, but she hadn't seen them since then. Slide. So the, another neighbor um, was the closest neighbor to the Martins, and this was Ashley Bright. And she lived five kilometers away. And when she was a teenager, she had worked in the general store, but now she didn't have a job. And the police suspected that she relied on petty thievery and drug deals in order to make a living. And when the police interviewed her, she said she had met them only, the Martins only a few times, and she hadn't seen Pamela since the previous year. But she said she knew that the Martins were at the cabin because Julia had told her so. Slide. So the question for forensic entomology is when did Pamela die? She was found March 30th, last seen alive on March 1st. Um, it seemed likely that John killed her on March 1st and went away on his job and then came back and reported her death. So John was a likely suspect. But we can use forensic entomology to determine when she actually died and if she died on March 1st, you know, based on the insect evidence, then John would be implicated in it. So we can use forensic entomology because as the body decomposes, different species of insects come on the scene at the corpse in a predictable pattern of insect succession. And so we can tell which insects are there, um, how long they've been there, and what time they arrived. Slide. So the body typically undergoes five stages of decomposition, and these can be altered by temperature and environmental conditions. Um, in Pamela Martin's case, she was in the decay phase. So the stages are when the, the body is first killed until it starts to bloat up. Um, we, we lost the slide. Okay. So in, until it starts to bloat up, um, that's called the fresh stage. And then the bacteria inside the body start um, creating gases. They're, they're decomposing inside, and they create gases that bloat up the body because it, it can't break through the skin. So that's the bloat phase. Then we have the decay phase, when the insects that have crawled inside and started eating and the bacteria are decomposing the body, when they break the skin, then the gases are released. And then we have active decay where we have a lot of organisms eating the body. Then we move into the post-decay stage when only the skin, the cartilage, and the bone are left. And then after insects eat the skin and cartilage, then we enter the skeletal stage and only the bones and the hair are left. Slide. So the insects associated with the fresh stage are the flies, Typically, blowflies, Caliphoridae, and fleshflies, Sarcophagidae, they come early on. And the adults are feeding on body fluids, and they're also laying eggs on openings, natural openings and wounds. Slide. So then in, in the um, you know, first stage, we have the blowflies arriving. They are very early. They're usually the very first to arrive. And they actually seek out bodies by a certain chemical that is released at death. And they, they find these openings in the body, lay their eggs. And these are the most important forensic insects in solving cases. Next slide. So the life cycle of these flies is they lay the eggs, again, within minutes of death. They hatch out and they molt three times into three different instars as they grow older. And the third instar is the last instar larva. It's the one that's the easiest to identify. They crawl away from the body to pupate because they want to pupate in quiet. They form these pupil cases in which the adult fly transforms from the larva um, during the pupil phase, and then, um, then they emerge as adults. So the time spent in each of these stages is very temperature dependent. Next slide, please. So the insects associated then with the bloat phase, a uh, lot of eggs were laid in the fresh stage. Some of those eggs hatched out and the, the larvae crawled inside and are feeding. And um, this is, you know, the, the beginning stages, essentially. 
So we've got the adult flies, the ones that showed up in the fresh stage, the blow flies and the flesh flies, but then more flies come, including latrine flies, dump flies, house flies. They continue to arrive during the bloat stage and they're laying eggs on the corpse. And now we start to get the first beetles. So the rove beetles, which often stick their abdomens up in the air, then they start to arrive. Slide. So then we have the decay stage. After these insects and bacteria have broken through the skin and released the gases, now this is a very active um, stage for insect feeding. So we've got maggots of all these different species of flies, um, the Caliphoridae and the Sarcophagidae, but many others that have come. And these others include black scavenger flies, small dung flies, dung flies, soldier flies, scuttle flies. These are all attracted to corpses. And now we start to have more beetles. So more beetles like the sylphidae, which are the carrion beetles, and then some other families um, start to become numerous on the body. Slide. So then we enter the post-decay. After they've eaten most of the flesh, all these um, different insects, then in the post-decay stage, the diptera become less numerous. And one family likes dried skeletons um, or dried skin. And these are the cheese skippers. You often find these on ham or you find them on dried cheese. So um, these, this is a late arriving species of fly. But the other flies, they like flesh. They're pretty much gone after the flesh is gone. Um, the beetle adults, though, continue to come. They tend to be in more drier stages, like the post-decay stage. And in, especially the dermestidae beetles um, are used to remove the skin and the cartilage from the skeleton. And in fact, people have used these beetles for hundreds of years in museums to clean the skeletons. They used to go out and shoot an animal and then stick it in with these dermestid beetle larvae and they would clean off the skin and the um, cartilage and then just leave a clean skeleton. We also get a few lepidopterans like clothes moths and other types of moths. And um, we also see a lot of soil arthropods, predators and parasites start building up at this stage. Next slide. So then we have the skeletal stage, which is essentially just skeleton and hair. And so there's not much left to eat um, for anybody. So most of the carrion insects are gone by then. And the insects that have built up in the soil, they start to decrease. Next slide. So we have to go through certain procedures in forensic entomology in order to ensure that our data are going to be reliable and solid enough to present in a court case. So first we have to bring the appropriate tools to the crime scene, I'll go over those. And then we have to collect the uh, appropriate environmental data from both from the corpse and then also the surroundings. Then we have to collect the insects from the body and from the surroundings. We have to get the right number and type of insects to collect and we need to preserve them appropriately. And then we have to follow chain of custody. So the first time we pick up an insect, we have to account for it um, throughout the process. Slide. So here are some tools to bring to the crime scene. And you might notice that they're, they're pretty simple. So a lot of entomology can be done with um, tools that you have in your own, your own garage, essentially. So these are just um, materials to pick up and, and collect and preserve the insects including some of them you want to keep alive. And so you would bring a cooler and freezer packs for this. If you're going to be doing any technical um, analysis, like DNA analysis, you would do that back in the lab. But in the field, it's, it's pretty simple. Slide. So the microclimate data you want to collect, you want to um, record the condition and the position of the corpse, describe the crime scene completely, including any blood spatters, you want to take temperature of the air, the body, the ground, the soil down to 10 centimeters, and also of larval masses because they generate their own heat and that can influence their development. Then you want to collect data from a local weather station on the dates from when the person first disappeared and then when they were found dead. And then to double check those data, you put in your own data logger and you record the 
temperature from then on, and then you compare it with the local weather station to make sure that it is um, consistent, essentially, that you're not maybe two degrees higher than the local weather station. Next stage, I mean, next slide. So from the body, you wanna collect all the natural orifices because that's where the flies tend to accumulate, any wounds underneath the body, inside the body in shoes, and then if a body was wrapped in a carpet or, or some other material, you want to check that thoroughly. Slide. And from the outside, you want to collect very thoroughly because a lot of these insects disperse away from the body after they have fed. So between 2 and 10 meters from the body, you want to look under stones and logs. You want to catch any flying insects. Um, you want to dig soil samples to get soil uh, insects that might have burrowed into the soil. So you go down at least 10 centimeters. And then you want to make sure that your crime scene is not just representative of the entire area. So you go outside of 10 meters, sample the insects there to see what the control situation is, and then you can compare your, your crime scene insects with that. Slide. So the number of insects to collect is um, fairly substantial, but sometimes there's so many insects that you don't have to collect every single individual. But you do want to take every size and type of insect that you find near the body and you collect them in separate vials. And if there are less than 100 specimens of a certain stage or, or species, then you collect all of those. But if there are thousands, you collect t 1 to 10 percent. So you have a, a good number of these insects. Slide. So we have different um, preservation methods for, for different stages. If the insects are dead, you can just put them right into alcohol. We use 70 to 95% ethanol. Um, the eggs, typically we like them to hatch out because again, the larvae are more recognizable. So you can put them on moist paper, make sure there's airflow and then let them hatch out. You can either rear them and get them to a later instars, or you could put teeny larvae directly into 70 to 95 percent ethanol. If you have live large larvae, you initially keep them alive just very briefly, and then um, you can either rear them out to adulthood, or you kill them and you put them in ethanol. You don't put them directly in ethanol for two reasons. One is because big larvae will start to rot even in alcohol, Another is that I think it's cruel because um, if you can kill them quickly, you should, and that is the best procedure anyway. So you either freeze them at minus 20 degrees C for an hour, or you can just toss them into hot water. They die immediately around 80 degrees C. And then after they're dead, then you put them in the ethanol for preservation. Slide. So then we have the pupal stage. And again, some people like to rear the pupae out to adulthood. The, the adults can emerge from the pupa. Um, or you can freeze them, again, at minus 20 degrees C for an hour, and then put them into the ethanol. If you have live adults, again, um, you're going to freeze them first and then put them in the ethanol. Um, don't put a live insect directly into ethanol. If insects have just emerged and you still plan on freezing them, you want to let them harden their wings first because the wings often have a lot of characters for identification and the insects have to pump them out when they first emerge. So you let them get their wings hardened and then you would freeze them and then put them in the ethanol. Slide. So chain of custody is very important. You have to record the name of the person in authority. It might be the forensic pathologist or the, the police um, authority. And the date, time, and location of the collections, you're going to have one code for the entire crime scene, and you put that on every sample that you collect. And then on every vial that you have, you put the code, and then write down what the contents are and the specific site of collection. And the vials must be sealed, and that preserves the um, chain of custody. Slide. So what we found in this case 
was that um, there were large maggot masses on the victim's mouth and nose, where, again, typical places for insects to enter. And there was also a wound in the abdomen that was full of maggot masses. And the wound was confirmed by a coroner later to be made by a 20 by 4 cm knife blade. The maggots that were found were pr primarily one species. There were a few others in there, but mainly Phoenicia cericata, which is a, a very common species and very well studied. We know how it develops at different temperatures. We know virtually everything about it. So because it was this species, we were able to determine that this species will pupate after 10 days at 20 degrees C. And the temperature, according to the local um, weather station, the average temperature was 20 degrees C in that area during March. And so the, the larvae um, were at the latest um, 10 days old. And we looked everywhere for pupae. So we, we hunted everywhere for pupal cases or, or active pupae, and we didn't find any. And now, if the body had been there since March 1st or the 19th, some of those larvae would have crawled away to pupate. We would have found them. But because we didn't, and all the larvae were confined to the body, we knew that the very earliest that Pamela could have been killed was March 20th. Slide. So we go back to our suspect. Now, if, if she had been dead since March 1st, John was the suspect because nobody had seen her alive since they drove up on March 1st. However, the insect evidence indicated that she was alive through the 20th. So if we still wanted to think that John was the killer, he must have returned to the cabin on that date. However, when the police checked with all his job contacts in the Northeast, they said he made all his stops on time. And when they looked at the mileage on the truck, it was only consistent with doing his regular route from leaving the cabin, doing his regular truck route, and then returning on the 30th. There was no excess mileage indicating that maybe he had come back early um, to kill her and then leave again. Slide. So please, we're still suspicious of John. He was a suspicious kind of guy. So they thought, well, maybe he came to the cabin secretly by a car or bus and then went back to his truck route. However, when they had, again, checked with all his contacts, um, they knew that he had followed his route as usual. He was accounted for all that time. So it didn't seem likely that he could have come back. Then they also speculated that maybe he had an accomplice who killed Pamela for him. However, John had very few friends. He, there was nobody they could identify as an accomplice. He basically kept to himself. So the police ruled out John as a suspect. His, his alibi was firm. So then they looked at the locals, including Julia Snow and Ashley Bright, the closest people to Pamela. Slide. And Julia Snow, again, she's the proprietor of the general store, she had no motive to mur murder Pamela. Um, Pamela regularly came to the cab, uh, the cab. Whenever she came to the cabin, she would stop at the store and stock up. Um, she was friendly with Julia. There, there was no motive for Julia to kill her. But Julia did recall when she, she learned that the, you know, the murder date was probably later on, she recalled that Ashley had come to the store around March 20th, and she was disheveled and appeared to have blood on her shirt at that time. So now the police were suspicious of Ashley. Slide. So Ashley Bright um, was now the suspect. And they obtained a search warrant for her cabin. And when they went in there, they found empty prescription vials for Pamela Martin's medications. And when they searched through the septic tank, they found a, a kitchen knife that had belonged to the Martins that was in the septic tank, and it was apparently the murder weapon. So the scenario is that um, Pamela discovered Ashley in her cabin stealing her medications. Pamela was dependent on these medications. She tried to recover them from Ashley, but Ashley stabbed her with her own kitchen knife um, when Pamela was trying to get the, the medications back. 
So now Ashley is implicated. And slide, slide. And the Fies had the final word. It was Ashley, it wasn't John. So I'd be happy to take any questions about performing um, forensic analysis of crime scenes. Great, thanks, thanks Abby. So Thank here, you. let me keep, let me stick on the last slide while we read some questions. Uh, so I'm getting some questions here uh, from, let me see. So we have from, so we have a couple questions about possibilities about pursuing graduate degrees, either in biology or forensic entomology or entomology in general. So here's one of them from uh, Yaja Khan from Orlando, Florida, uh, saying, hello, I'm currently an undergraduate uh, majoring in biology. Is it possible to go to graduate school for forensic entomology? I think also perhaps maybe you, you want to elaborate and discuss possible programs out there that are available either entomology or biology and their strengths. And yes, th there, there are a number of um, schools that do offer graduate degrees, both master's degrees and PhDs in, in forensics. And you can, as a subcategory, specialize in entomology. So definitely these options are available. We're trying to develop a program here at ODU. We don't have, we have courses, but we don't have a specific program. But if you're in Florida, University of Florida has a, a good program. Great. So what, what, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on what is being developed here at ODU? Well, we're trying to develop an, a master, an online master's in forensics, including forensic entomology, anthropology, botany, um, and then, of course, forensic analysis using molecular techniques. Interesting. How does that work out online? I would imagine there's got to be some lab components or components. Yes, well, that you would again, do. in our case, it's still in the developing stages, but there are, there are programs already online at other schools. But we can also have people come to... Um, ODU for maybe a, a summer or a couple months and learn some techniques that are primarily best learned in lab and um, and then you know do the rest of it online. Okay. Um, so we have, okay, so questions are kind of streaming in and so they're a little hard to, to read, but let me see if I can pick this one up. So we have from, uh, from Tyson Eric Tross from Chesterfield, Virginia here. Uh, could animals such as snakes or birds help decide when a victim was killed? So other than insects, is there any other uh, animals that can help in uh, sure, forensics? Sure, sure. Especially, for example, th they can often help determine whether a body was moved. For example, if you had a feather of a bird species that you knew was not likely to be where the body was found, you can often um, implicate, you know, where it came from based on, on the bird's distribution. Um, other mammals, I'm not, not so sure about using, um, pro probably it would relate to, you know, to other animals also, but um, insects are, are easiest because they're so small and, and mobile and, and identifiable in, in certain areas and, and follow the progress of decay in the body. Interesting. Uh, okay, so we have another question from Luis Angel uh, Vergara Ortiz from Hidalgo, Mexico. Um, could the murderer be able to manipulate or modify the conditions for experts not to find so easily the insects and collect the needed information? So could you imagine a scenario where the murderer is also an expert in, say, entomology and be able to alter the evidence in such a way that could throw off an expert? Okay, well, for, first, entomologists would never commit murder, so. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I would, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> but, but there are some cases where it's, it's a little trickier. For example, if somebody is killed inside, it depends on how barrier-proof that, that dwelling is. So that if it's, you know, in the dead of winter, inside, um, 
often insects can't gain access to it, but then there's some insects that might be primarily found inside, and so that can often be helpful. But it's um, in terms of using the insects, it's easiest, obviously, if there is access to the outdoors and all insects can get to it. But if somebody wanted to um, manipulate, you know, the decay process, they could probably do it. Put, put something in a freezer or sink them to the bottom of a lake, although they do have, um, there is forensic entomology that's aquatic also, and they often use search dogs to find those bodies. They'll um, like take a basset hound or something out on a boat, and when the, the dog can smell the body that's bar at, buried at the bottom of the lake, comes up through the water, and then it can point to where the divers have to go to get the body, and then the types of aquatic insects that are on it can be useful and but yeah, I'm, I'm sure you could kill somebody and, and get away with it without <laughs> insects doing you in. So <laughs> sounds good. Uh, okay, so we have uh, Tamar Rivera from San Jose, California. Uh, how do you go about identifying the correct species in the first step? So maybe I think a, a broader question that is related to this is. How do you, as a scientist or scientist in general, entomolo forensic entomologist, how do you manage to identify, how do you collect data to be able to, in an area, identify which insects are at which stage of corpses? Perhaps is a general way to ask this question. Right. Well, um, there, there's several ways to identify them. Now, more and more people are using molecular techniques to get to the exact species. However, if you're trained, you can identify species um, from different stages. You can identify a species of fly from the pupil case. Um, obviously, from the adult, you can do it, but you can also do it from the, the, the larvae. Um, the older the larvae, the better it is to use for identification purposes. So, um, there, But now with more molecular techniques, you can include that. Of course, that's more costly and not available to everybody. But... Um, even without that, you can still get to the identity of the insects and, and stage them and everything. Uh, okay, so let me read some of the questions. So we have uh, Shamkura Kumar from Chennai, India. Does the variety of insects change based on what region in the world the body is found in? Yes, and it's um, state by state, country by country. You're going to have your own suite of insects. Some insects are extremely common. Again, this Phoenicia cerakata is, is very well distributed. But um, some insects are only found in certain areas, or they might only be mountain insects, or they might only be desert insects. And so essentially what we need is a lot more forensic entomologists doing studies in all these different areas, looking at developmental times, under different conditions that these different insects would experience in order to get the background data that would help us. Yeah, so I would imagine they have to have data for almost every single stage of, uh, of the year, of the, you know, different stages of, of the year for different, air, my, you know, micro regions so that you have the, you can mimic the conditions that you would mimic in, a, in an actual case, no? Right, but temperature is really yeah. primarily the main one that's going to um, affect the, the development rate. But moisture can also affect it. Uh, a number of things can do it. Okay, sounds good. Let me see if I can find. Uh, they're getting a little, there's quite a few of them, so they're a little hard to read. Uh, I read that one. Okay, so we have one from Harrison Burke. Harrisonburg, Virginia, Anish Arate asking, I have heard about forensic inaccuracy or manipulation in past cases for various reasons. Is pressure to manipulate the forensic conclusions apparent in your experience? Well, yeah. yes, there's so, uh, not, not by entomologists, but by, but by defense lawyers or prosecutors. People always want the data to align what they say. So there have been challenges to forensic entomologists, um, just as there are challenges to, to doctors in, in many cases where they um, feel that either they, they didn't have the appropriate background to do it or they collected the wrong data. 
Um, so a forensic entomologist who's willing to go and do court cases really has to be able to back up every single aspect of their evidence. And that's why it's so important, again, to preserve chain of custody, to document everything that you do. Um, so, um, so we have a comment and a question from Monica Salinas Ibanez from Mexico saying, nice talk. Uh, what do you do with all the insects that you collect after you solve the crime? Well, it's, if it's evidence, you keep it. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so we have another question from uh, Nakul Chiam Kumar, who asked previously from India. I think that has a good one for many people out there. Um, what does an internship in forensic entomology entail? Well, uh, it depends on how, it, how it's structured. I mean, you could be taking courses or you could be doing a project. I once had a, um, a student who... She was from this area, but she had gone up to New York to um, take um, a, get a forensics degree, but they didn't really have a program where they could do research. So she came back with me and did a research project with me. And she was um, interested in looking at a lot of these flies will not be active during the night, but then there's some evidence that they, they do. So she looked at um, overposition by blowflies at night and during the day in both the rural area and an urban area, the urban area was my backyard. So um, I was able to help her out by checking the data at 2 a.m. or whatever, but she, she was doing all the other. And um, it, it was very interesting. She got a good project out of it. And, and that's the kind of thing that you can do. You know, take on a project that answers some questions that are still unresolved in the literature. That's some commitment, 2 a.m. Yes. <laughs> I, have like, uh, I don't it's know if I'm creepy willing to out do there work from my students. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Not sure I'm willing to do work for my students at 2 a.m. So power <laughs> to you know, more kudos to you. Uh, so we have a question that I think echoes some other ones by Rodrigo Padilla Juan from Mexico, from Mexico City, Mexico, asking which books or resources would you recommend to learn more about solving crimes with forensic entomology? Well, you know, there are a large number of, of books on forensic entomology, and I think they're all good. I think now, unfortunately, forensic entomology textbooks are very expensive. Um, I actually, when I teach forensic entomology, I use a, a book called um, Veterinary and Medical Entomology, and it covers forensics, and it's very cheap, and it's extremely good and thorough. So I, I really like that book. But forensic entomology books in general are, are very comprehensive, um, just very expensive. Do you have any maybe general audience uh, liter um, uh, journal articles or something like that, like perhaps uh, from just, mag you know, from science magazines that perhaps uh, young people could maybe get a little introduction into? Um, forensic entomology rather than a whole book also? That might be... Well, again, there, there are several journals. Some are direct, you know, directly related to forensics. Um, I think something like um, Forensic Science International. Um, some of these journals are good. But you can, um, if you just go to a good data search base like Google Scholar and just look up forensic entomology, you will find thousands of articles um, and they're, they're often very good. Sounds good. Um, okay, so we have more questions coming in. Let me read some of them. Okay. Uh, this one I don't know if I fully grasp, but let me pass it on to you. Leonardo Landivar Scott from Santa Cruz de la Sierra, Bolivia. How you how can you define the date of the disease if the crime scene if the crime scenes there were very few insects uh, or maybe the body if the body is in a in a form or it's in formaldehyde or alcohol so I think this was going back to to the other question if the conditions aren't quite so good for 
um, for insects to be present. Um, can you still put perhaps some bounds on the dates, some range of the dates, or does it get too inaccurate for you to be able to say something with confidence? Right. Well, usually not. For example, if a body were in formaldehyde or alcohol, then insects will, will not invade the body then. In fact, that's why we put, you know, put materials in, in those, um, you know, in alcohol and formaldehyde, which we don't use anymore because it's cancer causing. But um, however, for example, what if um, the body was killed and then they um, put the body in ethanol, in either alcohol or formaldehyde afterwards? then the insects might have already been there. They would be, be preserved along with the body and you would be able to tell, um, you wouldn't necessarily be able to date it, but you'd be able to tell where the body was, you know, whether it's exposed to the outside, that kind of thing. So again, these are good murder scenarios. Kill somebody, stick them in a freezer or put them in formaldehyde and you're good. <laughs> yeah, or, or just don't murder somebody you know right <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah so we have one from uh Cara Cabañas from Guaynabo Puerto Rico uh, who is asking is it true that forensic entomology dates back to the 13th century yes yes oh yes so oh. some of the very yeah. first cases were in China and um, now this one I've always been suspicious of, but apparently these farmers, they use sickles to cut their crop. And one of the farmers killed another with his sickle and then wiped off the blood. And so the um, overseer came and made them put all their sickles down in front of them. And all the flies went to the sickle with the blood on it, even though we couldn't see it, people couldn't see it. But the flies, of course, could smell it. Now, what I've always, that's always used as a classic example of the first case. However, what if somebody else switched sickles with him? That's what I've always wondered. What if he was falsely accused? I've always worried about that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good concern. It's a good story, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> also, yeah. <laughs> with a good caveat, too. Uh, interesting. Okay, so we have... Uh, so from Luis, uh, Luis Angel Vergara Ortiz from Hidalgo, Mexico. How important would you consider chemistry? How important would you consider that chemistry is for forensic entomology? Well, it's, it's very important. If Again, if you're doing DNA analysis, I mean, understanding chemistry and having a good background of chemistry is very important. I mean, I would imagine that it's a prerequisite if you wanted to study oh, absolutely. Yes. to take many chemistry classes. Yes, you need a lot of chemistry, a lot of biology. Sounds good. Uh, okay, so we have here another murder scenario for you. <laughs> uh, so we have from another, another person from India, uh, Abbas Sagan M from Tamil Nadu, India. What if there were two bodies, one killed 10 days after the other? Would identifying flies become more complex? So I think they're now trying to stack up bodies on top of each other and they were murdered at different times. Uh, does the entomology inc get more complex with the number of bodies and different time dates? Well, again, the, the flies are going to go to the body within minutes of death. And so they would already get a big head start on the body that was killed first. And the second body, they would be in the beginning stages. You, you could easily stage that. Just, um, it's not as though once you have a body, suddenly you have these insects that wouldn't have been there anyway. These flies, if you go out and you look around, they're just sitting on the tree waiting for something to die. They are just everywhere. So it doesn't really matter whether there's already another body. They're, each one's going to go through the stages appropriately. Um. And I imagine even by sight, right, you would see the decomposition. Would you be able to resolve by sight the decomposition of two different bodies that are separated by 10 days or so? Yeah, but by 10 days probably. Although, again, with um, the decay phase, it's very hard to know where they are in the decay phase unless you can tell what age the insects are. So they both might be having active feeding of maggots. However, one might have 
um, a lot that have already left and pupated, and then the other one, you know, the, the larvae wouldn't have left yet. Gotcha. Uh, okay, so I'm seeing a, lot of, seeing a lot of questions from India and Mexico. So if you guys are uh, forensic entomologists or looking for interns, maybe go to Mexico and India. Because uh, these people are really interested. So I have uh, from Utsav Shankar from Chennai, India. What are some of the forensic inaccuracies in forensic entomology? Okay. I think this is going back to a, a previous question, but maybe you want to. Right. Talk about well, that. there's often um, the time frame. You know, it, you you can't really say that somebody died at that second on that day. Usually you, you have to have a range because again, these larvae, they, they can take longer or shorter to develop. And so there's, there's kind of slop in terms of the actual time. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, the larval masses, when they're feeding together and there are a lot of them, they heat up themselves. And so they, de they speed up their own development. So if you're just going by air temperature or, or body temperature, but you're not actually looking at the larval mass temperature, you don't know exactly what the development rate should have been. So there, there are just a lot of ways to, um, you know, kind of lengthen that uncertain period. That's good. Um, I guess maybe a related question uh, that, that just came to mind uh, from reading this one. I mean, is there, big, can you identify, it? Do, you, do you know some big open questions in the field of forensic entomology or is it, was a, a fairly advanced field at this point, and it's it's trying to acquire more reliable data, uh, or is the methodology still evolving? Yeah, um, it, it's it's the latter. We are definitely we're still evolving and, and still trying to collect good data. So again, for each, um, I, I just really mentioned that one blowfly. There are hundreds of species of blowflies. We need to know the development times of all of them under all these different conditions. Um, the, I mentioned the, the night versus day, that's still not resolved. There's still questions about, because in general, flies go to bed at night and they don't lay eggs then. However, if there's a little bit of light, artificial light, how much light do they need in order to continue and um, oviposit? So there's just a lot of you know, really picky questions that need to be resolved before we can absolutely rely on it. This is basically a help in forensic entity. If, if nobody's certain exactly when the person died, you can rule out sometimes or get closer to sometimes, but it, it's mainly to assist with law enforcement. Great. Uh, so it seems like it's still a really rich field where uh, young people that are interested in uh, entomology or forensics um, can still come and contribute in a significant way. Um, so perhaps, so we have other questions, but I think maybe we're running out of time. So um, maybe last, it would be worth noting that we were, um, you will have a follow-up talk uh, yes. in October. And so for those perhaps that are interested, so we'll pass on these questions um, to you, Debbie, for perhaps if you have a chance to, to respond to them. But also, uh, if you're interested in this field, um, Debbie will be giving another talk in a month or so. So look at the at the schedule. Do you remember the exact date, Debbie? I, I think it was August 5th. That's my impression. I can right. check. But. Okay. Um, anyway, it's on the website. So if you are interested in this, um, please, please join us back again then uh, and uh, for now let me maybe take a second to remind you that let me stop sharing this screen and let me instead share uh, the main calendar website so here's the main calendar for regis um, you're just finishing the uh, this talk by uh, w waller from professor waller and next, we're going to have a session on the role uh, uh, about women in engineering, and this is in the panel section. So, if you're interested in which, I strongly encourage you to go to the streaming session for uh, for the panels uh, and and join the, the rest of the, 
join the panel, which is going to be a riveting conversation. So with that, thank you again, Debbie. It's been a real pleasure. Thank uh, you. Thanks again. And uh, everybody will see you again in October. So 